Hello again. Um, first of all, I need to apologize. Look at the lines already forming. I don't know how many room, how many people fit in this room. I don't, would you say a thousand, two thousand, something like that? And yet, for an entire hour, not one of you could tell me that I had a pair of cat ears on my head. So, thanks for that. I can't wait to see the pictures. I really thought I took them off before I came up, so... Anyway, um, yes, we have the, the big boy couch now, so we'll look a little better sitting in this thing. You won't swallow us like the last one. And uh, you're not here to see me that much, certainly not as much as our next guest, so I'll get right to the point. During the mid to late 1970s, he was a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company and in 2006 was awarded the Officer of the Order of the British Empire for his services to drama. I am getting louder. You know him for his sophisticated British accent and rich yet calm voice, and for his portrayals of assertive bureaucrats and sinister villains. You loved him in the imitation game, Alien 3, The Last Action Hero, Gosford Park, and until recently, Game of Thrones. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the East European Comic Con stage, actor and director, Mr. Charles Dance. I'm going to keep this short because we have a line already, uh, so welcome to Romania. Thank you. I'm sure you'll get a lot of that there. Uh, had a chance to see anything yet, or just the hotel in here? Really just the hotel in here. Okay. I think they'll fix that. I hope so. so. And uh, we're going to turn right over. I, I have a few questions, but I don't need to do anything because they'll handle it for me. You make my job easy, people. Thank you. Let's have at it. Uh, hi, welcome to Romania. Um, my question will be regarding uh, the part you played last year in the miniseries, and there, there were none, as uh, George Wargrave. Could you tell us what uh, drew you to that part? What were the challenges of uh, attacking this uh, role and uh, some uh, tidbits regarding uh, your experience on set with the other actors? Well, um, I'm a great fan of Agatha Christie, as many, many people are. Um, she was the consummate thriller writer, really. She devised, I think, more ways to murder people than any other writer. It's quite extraordinary. Um, it's a really, really good story. It has never been done on television before. There was a film adaptation a few years ago. And the duplicitous nature of the character really appealed to me because you don't really find out until the very end who it is who's murdered all these people in this very strange hotel. And most of the other actors I had worked with before, um, and some of it was shot in Cornwall, in the southwest of England, where I was brought up. Um, so for all of those reasons, that's why I wanted to do it. And one last question from my sake, because there's a great line. Uh, this year we're going to see you in uh, the rom-com um, movie, Me Before You. Could you tell us uh, something about your character and uh, what drew you to this part? Because it seems uh, something uh, refreshing from uh, the previous villain, villainy roles. Yes, I think it's a mistake to describe it as a rom-com. Um, it's actually a very moving film. My contribution to it is, is really no more than a kind of cameo, really, because the two central characters um, are what the film is about. And I play the father of the young man in the piece, Sam Coughlin. Um, I don't want, I, for people who've not seen this film, it, it would be a mistake for me to talk about the plot. But it's based on a best selling book. It's a love story, but it's ultimately very moving and uplifting eventually. But I can't tell you any more about it because it would spoil the film for you. We'll wait and see. Thank you so much. Have a great time here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh
I, um, I, I do want to interrupt because her question reminded me of a question that I have here. And I think that I deserve to ask this before anybody else gets to it out there um, about a role in an upcoming venue that uh, I'm getting conflicting reports. I can't see it confirmed or denied, so I imagine you are the man to do it. Do you or do you not have a role in an upcoming paranormal eliminator film due to be released later this year? No, I don't. Okay. So that was, it was, is he in Ghostbusters? Is he not? I couldn't. Uh... Oh, he's in Ghostbusters, yes. Well, that's what they is are. That, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. I don't need to know any more than that. No spoilers. Right. Thank you. Please carry on. Hello. Uh, last year, you heard the voice of uh, Emir, Emperor of Nilgard in The Witcher 3. And I wanted to ask you what uh, was your impression of the gaming industry? And would you see yourself working on a gaming project in the future? Um, that was my first venture into the gaming industry. I know very little about it. Um, but I know that it's a burgeoning industry. It is huge, in fact. It's a very strange process for an actor to work on that because I supply the voice and you're doing these characters. You read them cold. There's nobody else standing next to the microphone. So if I'm reading a scene that is between me and another character, it's just me, and I read the lines, and then gaps are left, and then I read my line again. And then they put the visual on after it. It's a very strange, but extremely clever process. Um, I've not been asked to do another one, but if I am, then I'm sure I will, because it was kind of intriguing, actually, to work out how it's done. You know, as actors, we're very often just tools, do you know? Um, especially in when it comes to animated films and things like The Witcher. Um, we are just one element in a very complex series of elements to produce this final thing. So it was, um, it was instructive and I hope successful. Yeah, it was very successful. Thank you. Okay, thank you too. Okay. Hello. First of all, Hello. I want to say that I'm looking really forward to seeing me before you. And my question for you is actually about Game of Thrones. And have you, have, have you been spoiled about what happens to Tywin Lannister's character? And either way, e either you have or haven't, what was your reaction of his tragic passing? <laughs> well, um, I hadn't read any of the books when I started work on Game of Thrones. Um, apart from anything else, they're about that thick, and that frightens me, because, you know, the end is not in sight. Um, and I was just, I was walking down a street one day, and a Game of Thrones fan came up to me and said, oh, Game of Thrones is wonderful, and he said, you've got this great death scene. <laughs> I said, have I? What is the manner of my death? And he told me. So I went into a bookstore and I got the book and I thumbed through it and I found the description of Tywin Lannister's death. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is an original way to die. Yeah, it is. And suitably ignoble for a man of Tywin's principles. I think by the time it happened, it was long overdue. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Hi, so it's a very great pleasure to meet you. And my question would be, if you wouldn't have played Tywin in Game of Thrones, what other character you would have wanted to play and why? Oh, without doubt, I would have liked to play Tyrion. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> no question. I mean, he's the most fantastic character. And I have to say, played by really one of the most delightful men I've ever met. He's a pleasure to work with. And I spent a lot of time apologizing to Peter because I treated him like shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if I wasn't to play Tyrion, then um, if I was 
Of the other persuasion, I would have loved to have played Daenerys, because she's stunning. Thank you. My pleasure. Hello. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what was the most emotional or touching scene that you had to play? Uh, how did it affect you? What did you feel then? Um, I think probably in the, I think the penultimate, my penultimate episode, there was a long scene with Cersei, Lena Headey, who has played my daughter about three times now. Um, and that was quite heavily emotional. But to be perfectly honest with you, it, it doesn't affect me one iota. My job is to pretend. That's what I do. And I go in and I pretend to be something. And at the end of the day, the pretense stops. It's as simple as that. I am not a method actor. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, if you were the ruler of your own country, would you be more like Tywin? or more of a benevolent tyrant like Vetinari? Oh, I would be more benevolent. I couldn't, I, I, if I was to be like Tywin Lannister, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. <laughs> I've too much of a conscience. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. I uh, really loved your performance in The Witcher and uh, Game of Thrones. Um, I want to ask you, if uh, your character would have been alive uh, at the time when uh, Cersei was forced to walk the streets naked and when Marcella died, what would Tywin's reaction be to everything that happened? How would he react? I would have probably thought, well, they had it coming to them. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Very great to see you here. Uh, w one quick question. Is there any role or any actor you regretted not working with or any role that you didn't actually get or passed off? I don't really understand your question. Okay, if you have any role that you passed out, uh, passed, um, and is there any Do I have any, you mean do I have any regrets at turning yeah, down roles? Yeah, exactly. No, not really, is the simple answer. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I can't elaborate on that, but it's a very simple answer. And any actors you would have liked to work a lot more with, by any chance? Oh, there are lots of actors, especially one in particular that I think is... Well, there are two in England anyway. Um, there are plenty of wonderful actors all over the world, but I think Tom Hardy is... Um, <laughs> I think Tom Hardy is his generation's Marlon Brando or Gary Oldman. He is a wonderful actor. And Mark Rylance. I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Rylance. Every time either of those actors work, they raise the bar another inch or two. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hello. Hello. I, uh, for one, admire Tywin Lannister's um, ruthlessness in making House Lannister back to its former glory. But I was curious, how do you feel about his approach? Would you change anything in uh, his way of putting House Lannister back to glory? No, but I mean, although Game of Thrones is, is, is fictional, it is based on fact. It's based on a feudal society, um, and it's medieval. And at that time, in a feudal society, if you had a position of authority, you had to do whatever was needed to maintain your position of authority. And I think the way Tywin behaved most of the time was the right way to do it. I agree with that as well. Thank you. Thank you. You're Hi. very quiet, Ken. You're very quiet. Fine. Hi. Well, no, only because he gave me an opportunity. Um, I did notice uh, a few minutes ago where you mentioned you weren't a method actor. 
And, um, but I, I d just now, with your very complete knowledge of the feudal system, and I'm noticing that um, all of the actors that we've had the fortune of being in touch with regarding Game of Thrones have really invested themselves into the, the backstory or the mythos or the, uh, the engine that makes the characters run um, above and beyond just what they need to get their job done. It, does that come instinctively? Is the show that compelling that uh, the actors just want to immerse themselves more and read the books and find out more about the job they're doing? Or is there like an edict coming down from on high saying, guys, educate yourself? Or I haven't met anyone who's just said, you know what, it's a job, I'm getting paid, and then that's it. So even, even though you're trying to say that, you're betraying yourself by showing a very complete knowledge of the behind the scenes. I think the reason any of us who are involved, are involved, were involved in Game of Thrones is that the quality of the writing is probably as good if not better than anything any of us have ever done. Um, and also the, the production values. HBO spend money in the right way. There are some scenes in Game of Thrones that, I mean, are so cinematic, absolutely fantastic. And also because of the time I've spent um, working on Shakespeare, I mean, I've done all the Wars of the Roses plays. Um, and George R. R. Martin will tell you that the Wars of the Roses heavily influenced his creation of this world of Game of Thrones. Um, but it really comes down to the quality of the writing. It's really, really good. And David and Dan, who wrote the piece and wrote most of the stuff, um, they took English degrees in Dublin. And despite the fact that they're American, not at all in any of the scripts does the word gotten appear. Now, gotten is, is an Americanism. It's certainly not an English word. It's certainly not a period English word. Gotten. Gotten. I had gotten this. If ever I'm, d if I'm d working on a piece of period English and I see the word gotten, the hairs go up on the back of my right. neck. It's, a, it's bad. It would be have got. Yeah, it's not I have good. got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So as far as the, the script writing, the production values, the budgets, and the quality of the shows, I guess it's finally safe to say that the stigma that television grew up with as being the poor second choice to movies or uh, stage plays is finally eroded, and uh, television can now hold its own. Oh, very much so. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, some of the best writing um, is now coming out of television. Yeah. It really is. Okay, well, yeah. living proof here. Thank so, you. Okay, we're going to go back to the line. Hi. Uh, you might have noticed that a Ghostbuster trailer had very much negative feedback. Why do you think that happened? Uh, I've not seen it. I didn't know there was negative feedback. Um, I'm a kind of straight man to a lot of very funny ladies. Um, and Paul Feig is a director I'd wanted to work with. So that's why I did it. But, you know where a lot of the time we're, we're hired guns, actors. It's very much a director's medium or a studio's medium. So we go in and we do our contribution, hopefully to the best of our ability, and then the end product is in their hands. I give you a perfect example. Alien 3 was a very different piece on paper than what you saw on the screen. And that's because it's a franchise and there are more people involved in the post-production of that franchise than there are in the making of it. And there comes a point where the director and the actors pass the product over to them and they do whatever they want to do with it. Yeah. So I can't tell you anything about Ghostbusters. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. When I get rich and famous and I'm a big name star and I'm the one here giving the panel and somebody's interviewing me, come back with that question, I'll be very happy to answer it for you. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I just want to thank you for coming, and I'm so glad to have gotten here all the way from America. Oh. <laughs> uh, my question for you is, in your opinion, as an actor, what is your strongest scene in Game of Thrones? Skidding the deer, I think. <laughs> thank you. 
Hi, Charles Dance, OB, such an honor to have you in front of us. Yeah, you got it from the Queen. Uh, about that deer one, I'll follow up the question. Did your hands like smell for a couple of days after skinning that deer? Yes. <laughs> I get that for, too. For, yeah, for about two days and I thought that um, when we finished the scene, I thought I might have got a nice haunch of venison to take home for the weekend. <laughs> I didn't even get a hoof <laughs> or an ear. Uh, all the questions about Game of Thrones have already been asked that I wanted to ask, so I'm going to go personal if you allow me. I read somewhere that uh, in an afternoon, a chimpanzee once dropped by for some tea. A chimpanzee knocked on your door. Can you elaborate, please? I'll happily ask questions. Yes, years ago I did a television series called First Born that was about... Um, a man who, uh, a scientist who bred a half human, half gorilla child. And um, we had a lot of animals on the set, one of which was a baby chimpanzee. And the woman who looked after this chimpanzee said, would you like me to bring Susie, that was her name, round for tea? And my children at the time were, I think, 12 and 6. And I said to uh, Rona, who looked after Susie, yes, by all means. And I told my kids, we've got a little friend coming round for tea on Sunday. And Rona came round with little Susie. And she was wearing a, a little diaper and a t-shirt. And she came and she sat at the table between my son and my daughter. And she helped herself to sandwiches. And the interesting thing was that she flirted outrageously with my son <laughs> and gave my daughter the cold shoulder. Uh, don't want anything to do with you. Um, it was quite extraordinary and then at one point Susie got down off the table and was crawling around on the floor. And we had a cat and I thought, oh, this is going to really freak the cat out. The cat paid no attention to this chimpanzee at all. <laughs> So there you are, that's how the chimp came for tea. Thank you so much. You're welcome. No, you can't. Hi. Hello. Uh, my name is Kathleen. Um, it's a pleasure to finally get to talk to you and ask you some, uh, some questions. Um, only one, okay. Well, sort of. Um, well, um, I'm a second year student in American Studies and I'm doing my dissertation paper on myth and religion in Game of Thrones. And I actually quote Tywin Lannister saying that uh, the wall and the reason it was built and the White Walkers are all an absurd lie spun by many a wet nurse in the North. So let's assume Tywin isn't dead and he actually acknowledges the danger. What's the first thing Tywin would do as a Lannister to protect the realm? What would you do? Build a bigger wall? <laughs> oh my god, that's Trump reference, okay? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes, yes, it's a bit Trump like that, isn't it? Yes. God help us all. Also, there's a fan theory out there on the internet that uh, Tyrion is actually the son of uh, Aerys the Mad King and Joanna. Now, I know that you're not really... Yeah, apparently Aerys had a crush, a huge crush on Joanna while she was uh, in his court and they might have done stuff behind Tywin's back. And that's why Tywin hates Tyrion so much. You actually have a line where you say, I cannot prove that you are not mine. Do you think there's something, a connection to that? Would you, I don't know, go in that direction? What do you think? Is Tyrion a Targaryen? A secret Targaryen? I think that's a fanciful notion. And the reason he says I can't prove that you're not my son is because the mentality of a man in that feudal society and that very male-dominated society at that time. Um, that men are top of the tree. Tall. Women are halfway down the tree. And little imperfections like Tyrion 
are really nowhere to be seen. Um, and that's why he says what he says about Tyrion. Okay. I think it's an interesting notion that you propose. There is I evidence to indicate that. Is there really? Yes. Okay. Well, you're obviously better informed than I am. I try. I have to because I have an exam on this. So, yeah, I have to be good. Well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope you like it here. Thank you. Uh, hi, welcome to Romania. It's very nice to have you. Um, my question is about Game of Thrones, because I got one. Uh, so, what actors would you have liked to share a scene that you didn't get to? Um, well, I've just done a film with Amelia Clark. Except me, Amelia. Me before. Oh, except Amelia. Oh, I see. I'm limited, am I? Right. <laughs> You're not really limited. Come on. Um, well, I've known Jonathan Price for a long time. That would have been a very interesting coupling. Yeah. Jonathan Price's character and my character. Um, but there, I mean, there are a whole range of characters that I, that because our storylines didn't coincide, that I would have liked to have played scenes with. But. I was very happy doing what I did, so, you know, I, I never kind of wish for other things. I try not to. Would you have liked the scene with uh, Sean Bean? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, hello. Um, hello. I have a question. Uh, of all the dead characters in Game of Thrones, aside from Tywin, who do you think should not die? Not reborn, but should not die. Of all the dead characters, like, I don't know, in your own opinion. Um, I think it's a pity that Sean Bean died so soon. <laughs> okay. And if you were to choose Joffrey and Tommen, who would it be? I mean, which is which? Joffrey or T Tommen? Do me a favor, stand a little further back from the microphone and don't speak so loud. Then I can hear what you're saying. So ask it again. Uh, Joffrey or Tommen? Which do, I, which do I prefer? Yes. As characters or people? As, as characters. <laughs> and people, maybe. <laughs> well, Jack Gleason is one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. He's a really, really sweet very intelligent young man and he plays that character as well as anybody could do so the combination of his talent playing a thoroughly disgusting character and his inherent niceness is very attractive actually and it fascinates me okay thank you you're welcome hello I want Hello. to ask you what do you think is your most underrated piece of work and why? A film and television. Probably a film that you have never seen. Um, a man who is known as the father of the documentary is called Robert Flaherty. And in 1922, he made a film called Nanook of the North which was basically a year in the life of an Eskimo, Inuit. And I did a film that was the story of the making of that film. And it was shot in the Russian Arctic in winter. And I lived on an icebreaker on the Bering Sea for four months. We ran out of winter. We picked it up a year later in Arctic Canada. And the end result is a really rather remarkable film. But it had a very limited distribution. But when people talk about how tough The Revenant was to make, I can tell you it wasn't a patch on what we went through making that film. And because it had limited distribution, very few people have seen it. But it's a piece of work that I'm very proud of. And it's called Kablunak. And if you ever come across it and you can get hold of it, I would urge you to watch it. I'll try to get it at home. Good man, thank you.
Hello and welcome to Romania. Even though I've seen you in very many serious roles where you play strong male characters, I have also seen you in panel shows in which you have actually very funny uh, stories to tell. And one which I recall is when you told the story of how you tried to persuade the father of your girlfriend that you should marry her or something like that. <laughs> there was a British panel show, as long as I remember. Forgive me, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have a problem remembering what I did last week, let alone months ago. Um, trying to persuade the father of a, somebody I wanted to marry that I don't know. Hmm, well, then something else. Are you, you sure it was me? Yes. Uh, on the big fat quiz of the year. Yes. Where you read, you had this thing with reading books. Can yes. Can you remember something from the autobiographies that you read? Oh, God, no. No, I can't remember them at all. I'm doing a few more in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, I want to know what souvenirs did you take from the set of Game of Thrones? <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. What did he say, Ken? Have you taken any souvenirs from the set of Game of Thrones? Yes, a hand of the king. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, first of all. Hello. It's wonderful to meet you. And my question is about, um, about the fact that Tywin Lannister is a very complex, complex character. And of course, he's also very evil. Uh, and I was wondering if you have a process that helps you get into character when you have to play, especially uh, a villain. <laughs> I learn the lines and try not to bump into the furniture. <laughs> Do you have any advice for aspiring actors or for, for people like me who are trying to learn about acting? Advice for aspiring actors, don't do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Actually, I am going to interrupt uh, with a quote, and I'm quoting, quoting uh, you, actually. If I were to advise my 16-year-old self, I would tell him not to be too impatient. So clearly in there, there's some kind of advice that could be relevant for our younger audience members. Um, can you tell us what you meant by that statement? Um, yeah, the world moves at a much faster pace now. I would hate to be a 16-year-old now. I think the pressure that there is on people to achieve, um, I mean, without getting too complex about it, you know, the root of the word educate is to bring out. That's what it means. But education now means to put in, to cram in. And I don't know what the education system in Romania is like, but in England it's all about tables and achievements. And, and the pressure is enormous. And when I say just don't be impatient, just wait don't be don't be too impatient to achieve too early I'm a great believer in fate what is to be will be things happen when they're ready to happen for you do you know and um, because of the age that I am now I play fathers God forbid grandfathers and and I'm working with 20 21 year olds who they get a successful television series under their belt and they're on a plane immediately to America to get in a big mini-series and they make a lot of money but they go as quickly as they arrive and I have the benefit of two very wise old men who taught me and um, their advice was don't be impatient you know just learn what you're doing and also learn to know when you're not being good. Learn to be objective. And that can only happen with time. 
unless you're very, very bright. So just be cool, take it easy. If it's going to happen, it will happen. So just realize that a career and a craft are two different things. Exactly. Please. Uh, first of all, thank you for that glorious bit of advice. I really needed it right now. And I have two questions. Um, I have a serious question and maybe an upsetting question. Uh, the first one is about Ladies in Lavender. I just saw it uh, last night and I wonder if you could about talk about what? Sorry? Ladies in Lavender, your movie. Oh, okay, yeah. And I just saw it and I wanted to ask about your writing and directing and if you have done any more of it and if you plan on doing some and if you could talk a bit about that movie in particular. Ladies in Lavender came about because I was, um, I was doing a film in Budapest and sitting on a set, there was a library set there were a lot of books, obviously, and I was waiting for the cinematographer to finish lighting the set. And I took one of these books down, and it was a series of short stories, and I kind of read them all in a couple of hours, and I kept coming back to this story, this funny little story about these two old ladies living down in Cornwall, where, as I said earlier, I was brought up. And I knew immediately how I would make a film of that. Now, I didn't go to acting school, I went to art school and I studied graphic design and photography and I like to think that I understand the language of a camera. And that was a very simple story and I didn't want to, if you understand the expression, I didn't want to bite off more than I could chew. It wasn't a very ambitious piece, it was very, very simple. And I wrote the adaptation of it and I took it to Judy Dench, who I've known for some considerable time, and she said she would do it. <clears throat> I then went to Maggie Smith, and Maggie, in her own inimitable way, said, is Jude going to do it? <laughs> and I said, yeah, she said, all right, well, I'm doing <laughs> So with Judy Dench and Maggie Smith, I could have shot the telephone directory. <laughs> That's how that came about. It is aimed very specifically as what is now called the Grey Pound, which is film product aimed at people over the age of 25. Um, because for people really from their 40s up to their 60s, there is very little product, or there was very little product in the cinema. It thankfully was a great success. I look at it now and there are many things about it that I would do differently. Um, as for doing something else, yes, I have a project at the moment that I'm in the middle of trying to raise the finance for, which is not easy because you're asking people to effectively lend you rather large amounts of money with no guarantee that they're ever going to get a penny of it back. Um, but hopefully we will start shooting that in May of next year. I'm not going to tell you what it's about because I'm rather stupidly suspicious. So. A superstitious, I meant to say. Uh, what, now, this, was that your serious or your amusing? That was um, my serious question. That was your serious <laughs> question, right. Uh, I have in my hand, I wanted to keep this as a surprise for the autographs, uh, the autograph session, but uh, I couldn't resist. The star will land is on one side, and then there's you in a dress in the other side. <laughs> the <rest cut. laughs> and uh, how did that happen? How did LEG in the house happen? Well, <laughs> um, I was doing a film called Gosford Park with Michael Gambon, who I've known for a long time. And Michael came in one day and said, here, I've got this Ali G script. I said, so have I. He said, you're going to do it. I said, well, I'll do it if you do it. So we agreed and we went in and we spent about three weeks doing this film with Sasha Baron Cohen. And the film was finished. And I was driving through London one day and my phone rang and it was the director. And they were in post-production and they decided that they were going to shoot a different ending to the film. And he said, I want to run something by you, Charles. I said, what's that? He said, would you ever appear in a dress? I said, if you pay me, yes. <laughs> so the picture that you have, in case nobody else has seen it, I am wearing a red rubber micro skirt, 
a leopard skin crop top, four inch high heel thigh boots, and rather fetching drop earrings. <laughs> well, thank you for the applause, but I have to tell you that how women can wear high heels, I don't know, because walking in these boots for the day um, put my back out and it, I was in great pain for about a week. So I admire you greatly for wearing things like that. I don't know that I would like to do it again. Thank you. My deepest respect. So I only got one question, and that is, uh, what made you switch from graphic design to uh, actors, to being an actor? You said you, didn't recom you don't recommend to uh, upcoming actors to try being an actor. Why? Uh, do you regret uh, going into actorship, or uh, do you think it was a good choice? I think it was a good choice. Um, I'd kind of, I'd enjoyed acting at school. Um, but then I didn't, I didn't really know how to be an actor. I, I, I didn't know any other actors. And I was reasonably artistic, which is why I went to art school. But then there was a student theatre company, and I found myself getting more and more involved in that than I was sitting in a design studio. And also I began to feel that graphic design, certainly in advertising, is mostly about form rather than content. And I liked to involve myself more in the content than the form. And I hope I made the right choice. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. I, um, I, I might submit at this point that uh, being a graphic designer is actually quite a natural progression to acting, thanks to the clients because you have to act like they know what they're talking about. You have to act like their decisions have logic, and you have to act like their ideas are worth acting upon. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are, I've, I've done only about two commercials in my time, and you know, you're working with a director who probably works in television and film, and a camera crew who do the same kind of job, but then you're dealing with account execs from advertising agencies and they think they're all creative and they've, all, and they've got all their ideas and um, yeah, one has to be very patient dealing yes. with them. Yes, not stabbing them takes a great deal of acting. You're absolutely right, Ken, yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question for uh, your kind of character in uh, Game of Thrones. So there was a scene uh, at one point where you were talking with Tyrion about Daenerys Stormborn and her uh, threat uh, for your house at the time being. Um, your line was something like, she doesn't rep represent a threat for the time being and uh, we won't do anything about it. Why would you uh, do such a thing? Why not? taking her down right now and why would you wait for her dragons to grow up and uh, represent a real threat to your house? Probably his attitude was because she is a woman and in his eyes no woman can really be a threat or also because he doesn't want to be seen to be suspecting that she might be a threat. I mean, that's a sign of weakness, you know. For somebody like Tywin Lannister, you would never reveal any kind of vulnerability at all. More than that, I can't really go into great detail. I mean, you have a better memory about it than I do. Um, I'm lucky enough to work almost back to back, and I've done quite a lot of work since Game of Thrones. And once a job is finished, the lines go straight out that ear. Okay, thank But you for your thank you for watching and being so interested in it anyway. Thanks. Hello, it's a great honor to meet you. My pleasure. Uh, I see that uh, the main subject here is Game of Thrones. So uh, I was I was going to ask you about the scene uh, in skinning the the deer. 
uh, how was uh, how was the experience for you? How do you prepare for that scene? Do you actually did you actually skin before skin uh, before the scene? Did you actually had to skin another deer to learn how to do it? Yes, David and Dan, the writers, came to me about a week before we shot that scene, <clears throat> and they said, "Are you vegetarian, Charles?" And I said, no, why do you ask? Well, they showed me this scene. They said, have you ever butchered a deer before? <laughs> I said, no. So they brought in this man with a dead deer and a selection of knives. And he showed me how to skin a deer. So then when the day we came to shoot the scene, he came in with another deer and the knife that I had decided I was most comfortable with and I just did what I'd learned to do basically did you find it difficult to do it no thank you very much you're welcome now I have I have a question uh, because I'm, I'm from a props point of view if you had said or if you if you are a vegetarian, if you were a vegetarian, uh, did they discuss what the options might have been? Like, would they have rewritten the scene to be without a deer, or would they have constructed a deer from foam and, and gelatin and whatever? Did they ever discuss what would have happened if you said yes? No, they didn't, and I don't know what they would have done. Whether yeah. Maybe they would have had me kind of shredding a cabbage or something, <laughs> or peeling a potato. Nothing says ruthless like that. Okay. Well, hello there, Mr. Charles. Hello. Most people think Tywin is a villain, but I really think he's a good guy because I see wisdom in his decisions as he's smart about what he does for his family. Except for one thing, and that thing led him to his death in a bathroom. Uh, he has a really personal problem with Tyrion, and I never understood why he has got that problem. Could you explain? Well, I thought I explained earlier, actually, the problem is that a man of Tywin's character in, um, in a world like that, in that feudal world, that, you know, I mean, somebody who suffers from dwarfism, that is an imperfection. Um, I don't know that Tywin is a particularly nice man. I don't know at that time that he was particularly villainous you know he was just doing what he had to do to maintain his position but his attitude to to Tyrion was just this is unfortunate this is an imperfection the problem is he has to he he could never admit that of his three children the most likable and the most intelligent of those children is this little guy and uh, I think that was that presented Tywin with a lifelong dilemma really oh thanks for the answer from my point of view I think uh, this happens because George R. R. Martin has a matter of British humor about Tywin that he just picks randomly of Tyrion just because he's a name as a pretext I don't think that that's peculiarly British <laughs> Thanks for coming in Thank Romania. Thank you. Hello. Uh, regarding the scene between Tywin and Arya, where they talk and they connect, but he doesn't know who she is, if you were to figure it out, uh, but in a subtle way, and she didn't notice that he knows her identity and nobody else around them knew, what do you think he would have done? if uh, he had the choice between ignoring her true identity and acting upon it? If he... Yeah. If I'd known who she was, do you mean? Yes. I'd have probably had her killed. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would but I have to tell you, just by the by, that little Maisie, I think she was 13 when we shot that scene. She's one of the most gifted young people I've ever come across actually. She's the most extraordinarily talented girl who was so aware of 
the whole business of filmmaking and what cameras did and where the position of the camera was and how to underplay rather than overplay. She was a joy to work with. That's my abiding memory of, of working with her. Thank you. Um, I am so sorry, but we have time for maybe two more questions and then we're going to have to call it. So I apologize to everyone who's waiting. Uh, we just are running out of time. So two more victims and, uh, and we'll have to say we're done, please. Uh, because uh, we've been uh, talking around here about villains and evil. Uh, you recently played in uh, sci-fi's adaptation of Arthur C. Clarke, Childhood's End, and uh, that am amazing portrayal of Overload. And uh, how did you feel? You know, it, it was visually amazing, that scene. I read the book. I didn't quite imagine like that, and they took a step further, and they presented the Overlord like that. I don't want to spoil very much about the series. How did you feel, you know? Not with the prosthetics and everything, but you know, that was amazing visually about the evil and the Yes, people. Childhood's End for devotees of sci-fi is a, is a classic. It's probably Arthur C. Clarke's finest piece of work. It's an extraordinary book. We shot it in Australia at the hottest time of the year. The makeup took about four hours to put on and about two hours to get off. So the answer to your question, how did I feel? Okay. The simple answer is hot. Um, when I agreed to do it and when I saw the plans for the makeup, um, I thought, well, could be anybody under this. Could have been Ken, you know, and uh, especially with those contact lenses. But I was astonished when I saw it, see that actually I could recognize me underneath all that, which is quite an achievement. I don't think it's an achievement on my part, it's an achievement on the people who designed the whole look of the thing. Um, but I can't often say this, or can't always say this, but when I saw it, I was quite impressed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here today, and I'm really happy to be the last one, really lucky to <laughs> ask you a question, and I'm going to be really brief. Um, I just wanted to ask, what was the funniest thing that happened to you ever on set, so in either movie? Oh, blimey. Um, I suppose the, there was a guy earlier on who had this photo outfit for the Ali G film. Yes, tragically, we are out of time, but I want to thank everybody, Charles and everybody out there, for a very interesting and successful panel. So, please, one more big round of applause and a thank you, Mr. Charles Dance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. I'll be staying for a minute, okay? Thank you again, Mr. Dance. I, uh, I'm going to tell you what's coming up here on stage next in a few minutes. Something called the Freeman Panel, uh, which apparently will be an assortment of exclusive trailers and previews. Uh, being exclusive, everyone is strongly advised not to bring any recording devices or anything. There will be additional personnel looking for this and you will be hunted down and killed. So, exclusive trailers, but enjoy them here and nowhere else. Also, I want to remind everybody that there is a party tonight after the convention closes at the Promenada Mall, starting at 9 o'clock, and it's featuring DJ Podrick, as in Daniel. And uh, the entry requires your bracelets from the convention. Okay, yes, also on this stage, after the Freeman panel, will be our first cosplay event. 
So if you're going somewhere else now, just follow the smell of hot glue and uh, it'll bring you back here for our cosplay event in half an hour, I think. Yes. See you soon. This job. We try to save as many people as we can. Sometimes that doesn't mean everybody. But you don't give up. New York. Washington, D.C. Sokovia. Okay, that's enough. Captain, people are afraid. That's why I'm here. We need to be put in check. Whatever form that takes, I'm game. I'm sorry, Tony. If I see a situation pointed south, I can't ignore it. Sometimes I wish I could. Sometimes I want to punch you in your perfect teeth. I know we're not perfect. But the safest hands are still our own. to watch their back. This doesn't have to end in a fight, Tony. You just started a war. Stay down. Final warning. I could do this all.